This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not medical care or advice. Clinicians should rely on their own medical judgments when advising their patients. Patients in need of medical care should consult their personal care provider. Welcome to That's Pediatrics, where we sit down with physicians, scientists, and experts to discuss the latest discoveries and innovations in pediatric health care. Hi, I'm Allie Williams, a pediatric hospitalist here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I'm Smerig Nohotri, an assistant professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery. And thanks for listening to That's Pediatrics. Today, we are so thrilled to have Dr. Maya Ragavan here from the Division of General Academic Pediatrics. Not only is she a fabulous clinician, but she is also a wonderful researcher who has a focus on intimate partner violence and is here to talk to us today about some of her research and some of her clinical experiences. Thanks so much for being here. So to, to kind of roll into it, we always like to start out with just kind of a fun question. Um, and it seems like you've lived in many different areas. So what's your favorite thing about Pittsburgh? So I think my favorite thing about Pittsburgh is the community partners that I've worked with here. And so I have lived in Pittsburgh mainly during the pandemic. So it's been a little bit hard. I moved here in 2019. And I have been so blessed to work with incredible community-based organizations. Um, So one of the organizations I work with a lot is Casa San Jose. They are a wonderful group of people who support um, uh, the Latino communities here in Pittsburgh um, and other immigrant and refugee organizations and other organizations in Pittsburgh. And um, just the the work that they do really inspires me and just how welcoming that they've been um, to sort of connect me with community partnered research research has been wonderful. And then I absolutely love uh, my colleagues here. I mean, it's, it's a great group in the Division of General Academic Pediatrics, and I work a lot with adolescent medicine. So I feel really lucky. So I I just love the connection. I love the the community here. Um, I think it's really, really fun to be here because of that reason. That's awesome. Uh, Do you know what things drew you to Pittsburgh and especially uh, Children's Hospital and UPMC and yeah, yeah. So I um, think that's a great question. I will be honest. I came here for the one and only Liz Miller. Um, I wanted to work with her because she is an amazing uh, researcher, a brilliant, innovative person, and I've always wanted to work with her. And so I really, I came here because I wanted to work with her. Um, and there are other people when I did my interview here, like Dr. Diego Chavez Henico, um, that I met and I just thought were incredible. I, you know, Deb Bogan, there's so many. So I really came here for the people. Um, I came here to work with these people. And I am so glad I, I did. I don't have any family in Pittsburgh. I have one friend here. But other than that, really, I, I came here to work with the people in my division, you know, more broadly at the Children's Hospital. And I'm really, really happy that I came here. I, I really love working here. So. And now I bet you have more than one friend. One friend here. <laughs> I feel like Pittsburgh is a great community in which you can really easily um, acclimate to. I also, you know, had the same um, experience that you did where I, I moved here for none other than training. And I just feel like it's a great environment. Um, and so is the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, but not only is Liz Miller, Dr. Liz Miller, a powerhouse, you are too. Um, you have done some very impressive things, even in your short career here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Can you talk to us a little bit about your clinical passions? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so my, uh, my clinical passion, I think, is... Um, really providing healing-centered care for families. And so I'm a general pediatrician. I became a general pediatrician for so many reasons, but I think the biggest is because I love building relationships with families. I think it's so fun to see, you know, a kid grow up, you know, and be part of their life for all of that time. Um, I love the continuity aspect of it. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm, I love sort of um, supporting families. I love providing holistic care. Um, so really thinking about ways that um, that community and structural level um, factors impact care, and then really like holding up a strength-based lens. So really thinking like, how can I, as a pediatrician, support you and your strengths and build kind of relational health and, and support, um, support, support your, um, your strengths. Um, and so that's what I love. And then I'm really passionate about this idea of becoming more trustworthy. So I think one of the things that 
I've been reflecting on a lot is we often talk about trust in medicine and we, we often ask families to trust us. And I think I, we re, you know really think it's important to flip the script a little bit and say, what can I do to earn your trust? So, you know, for so many, for so many folks, especially folks um, from marginalized communities, there's really no reason for, for them to trust us. There's been much harm right. that has been done historically mm -hmm. and um, in the current day. And so I'm really interested in how, uh, how can I as a healthcare provider and how can the healthcare systems that I work for become more trustworthy? So I'm really passionate about that idea, teaching that idea and then sort of uplifting that idea as well. You also have um, not only great clinical interests, but some research interests as well. Have your research interests overlapped with that clinical interest at all in looking at how to help you know minorities in the community um, have faith in the healthcare system? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so I think my my broad research interests or my research focus is on earned work. So I would say absolutely, because I think what community partnered work does in its essence is it thinks about how do we uplift and amplify the voices of communities and really include them in co-creation of science. And so I think it's one thing to say, okay, we'll work with the community partner to help us recruit, but that's not really dismantling power inequities. That's still me as a researcher coming up, leveraging your own social capital to, to sort of allow me to complete my study. And that's not what community partnered research is. Yeah. Community mm -hmm. partnered research is co-creating science together. So as an example, I just finished a study with multiple immigrant and refugee communities in Pittsburgh, where we were doing um, focus groups in multiple languages to understand the COVID-19 vaccine uh, vaccination, excuse me, experience of non-English speaking immigrant and refugee communities. And the reason that we need community organizations um, and, and myself as well, as, many, as well as many others, were um, trying to support vaccine access for the COVID-19 vaccine at the beginning of the, the rollout. And we're noticing that a lot of the ways that people could register for the vaccine were in English. And so yeah. non-English speaking communities really mm -hmm. just didn't have great access. And so that idea of let's preserve this history, let's understand the experiences of non-English speaking immigrant and refugee communities. That came not just from me, but it came from, from all of us together. And we wrote a, a, a pilot grant together. We did this project together. We, we're, we're publishing hopefully soon together. Um, and that is community partnered research, like really from start to finish, co-creating science. And so that's what I'm really passionate about. And I think that very well aligned of how can we become more trustworthy? And a lot of it is really leaning on the expertise and the, the wisdom of communities. And I think the other thing um, that um, that Dr. Miller talks a lot about, and I, I also um, want to just uplift a lot, is this idea of you know not being extractive in our work and making sure we're compensating community partners for their time. Sure. And so one of the things that I think is really important is also making sure that you know while we're um, centering the voices of community organizations, leveraging their wisdom and social capital, that we're also equitably compensating them. So I think that's kind of the essence of of the research that I do and that I love, and it kind of spans multiple topic areas, which we can talk about. But that's a sort of the my, my passion and research is sort of focused on community partnered work from that lens. Right. And can you talk a little bit about your uh, research, uh, any studies that you're conducting or any uh, things in the field that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, yeah. So my um, so my work um, kind of with that community partnered lens, um, I focus a lot on partner violence prevention. There's kind of two big areas with that. The first is um, how do we create healing centered spaces in pediatric healthcare settings to support survivors of partner violence, whether it's a parent or caregiver or an adolescent. Um, and then the other er area that I'm really passionate about is how do we engage parents and caregivers and trusted adults in dating violence prevention? And so um, one of the things, um, so I can talk a little bit about both of those, but one of the things that we um, were working on, uh, this includes folks from, uh, from Pitt as well as Friends Without Violence, which is a, a national kind of gender-based violence equity group um, and social policy group. Um, and the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Centers for Disease Control, we were trying to understand the experiences of partner violence survivors during the pandemic and um, really trying to understand like what was their lived experience during the pandemic? What were some of the challenges that they went through? And what we found was, I think, really important for folks, for healthcare providers to know, so, you know, um, intimate partner violence survivors were experiencing a lot of isolation during the pandemic. I mean, we were all experiencing so much isolation, Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but they were experiencing sort of compounding isolation um, because one of the, you know, one of the, um, one of the sort of fundamental pieces about IPV is power and control and isolation. And so um, 
partners who are using violence, who are using the pandemic to isolate folks even further, like cutting off their cell phone service, taking away their stimulus checks, um, not allowing them to seek health care, things like that. And so really understanding the ways that COVID was actually being used to control and manipulate and isolate survivors. So that came out a lot from our study. And the other thing that came out was really how survivors from marginalized communities or who had one or more um, marginalized identities were experiencing even more challenges. So um, as an example, um, some of the folks we spoke with worked with immigrant survivors of IPV, and they were, they were talking about how a lot of immigrant survivors were not able to access the same sort of resources that, um, that folks were, that were not immigrants, you know, that, that have documentation here were able to access. So they were experiencing even more challenges sort of rooted in structural inequities. And so that came out a lot from our study. And I think the other thing that I want to highlight that came out from this study was the importance of collaborating with um, victim services agencies. So folks talked a lot about how um, domestic violence agencies, so an example in Pittsburgh, for example, is like the Women's Center and Shelter, really were doing so much work during the pandemic. They had, you know, they were uh, moving all of their services to virtual. They were creating like text line and chat lines. They were partnering with grocery stores to try to support survivors. So I just want to like really uplift the work that they do and remind us all as healthcare providers that their victim services agencies and domestic violence advocates are a really important part of our healthcare system. So it's really important that we collaborate with them to serve our patients. I think that is so important to have all of this research and to work with these community partners to identify what some of the, some of the many challenges are um, with intimate partner violence survivors, especially in light of the COVID pandemic. I mean, like you mentioned, it was fearful and isolating for everyone, but for this particular group of individuals, it must have been even, even more so, which it sounds like your study really highlighted. Yeah, absolutely. There were so many challenges. And there was, you know, a lot of talk about resilience too, a lot of self-care, community care, the way that communities were coming together to support survivors, which was also really uplifting to hear. Um, and so it was it was really important to sort of hear also hear about the resilience that came through in this work as well. I bet with your research and identifying um, some of these challenges that they experience is you also have a lot of experience with solutions, not necessarily solutions, but um, ways to bridge um, and try to fix might not be the best work. So I don't know if we can fix everything, right? But to make these um, challenges easier, what are some things that we could do as healthcare providers to overcome some of the language barriers that you've been talking about? Is there, do you have any tips or tricks that we could use? Yes, absolutely. Um, and sorry, can we t- to clarify um, yeah. like language barriers for non-English speaking folks? Or do you mean like to support domestic violence survivors? No, um, I would say, I mean, in all honesty, I guess both, both right? Yeah. Because okay. if you're bringing up both, sure. um, I was thinking more language barriers with non-English speakers. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, there most certainly is language barriers with even just having these discussions with sure. patients too. It's challenging for a lot of us, especially those for uh, healthcare providers who haven't been trained. Yeah, yeah. No, it's such there's such important questions and I can answer both briefly. Um so in terms of supporting non-English speaking communities, I think the most important thing is using interpreters. And so we are we all have access to in-person interp well we all have access to the Syracom system. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there needs to be more access to in-person interpreters as well. And as a reminder, you know, it's not just at the provider level. So sometimes, you know, we as, you know, at the provider level or the clinician level, we use an interpreter, but it's every from start to finish, yeah. every moment that one of our patients is interacting with us from when they pick up the phone to make an appointment or when they enter the front door to when they leave, they should be able to access um, services in their language. Um, we also need to make sure that we're asking people a- about their language in a really thoughtful way. And so, you know, making sure that we're not um, only asking people their language preferences based on, you know, our own assumptions, but rather mm-hmm. we're asking sure. that universally. And I do want to highlight here um, one of my colleagues who's doing a lot of work at the Children's Hospital, who I'm sure you all know, Maria Say, and just uplift her work because she's an amazing, you know, force and has done a lot of work for Um, for us to make sure we have better language equitable services. And so I think that that's important. Mm -hmm. And in terms of supporting IPV survivors, I'll just list a couple suggestions. The first is 
I don't recommend, and a lot of Dr. Miller's work has been in this um, screening, I recommend providing everybody with some universal education and resources around IPV because there's so many reasons why a survivor may not want to tell us about this incredibly traumatic thing happening. So I recommend providing everybody resources. Um, if somebody discloses they're experiencing IPV, the first thing to do is just center yourself for a moment because it's very stressful. You know how they say like, I haven't, you know, I have not been inpatient in a while, but how they say, like, if, if there's a code, like, check your own heart rate first, I think it's really similar. Like, just make sure your, your, your nonverbal expression, like, you know, that you're in a calm place. Um, and then what survivors say they want doctors to do, healthcare providers to do, is listen to them and not try to fix this. This isn't something that can be fixed all the time. Right. This is something where we need to create a space where we're listening in a non-judgmental way. So that's also what I recommend. And then just make sure that you have um, resources to our local community-based organizations. Like I was saying, we're lucky here in Pittsburgh. We've got the Women's Center and Shelter, Crisis Center North, the Center for Victims, Pittsburgh Action Against Rape. Um, and if we have someone that's not from Pittsburgh, the Pennsylvania um, Coalition Against Domestic Violence has resources. So just make sure you know who your resources are and help survivors connect with them. We never, I would, I never recommend like pushing resources on people. So if a survivor says, I don't want that, I don't recommend saying, oh no, definitely take it. So you never know, you know, the, the safety level and sure, survivors know right. how to keep themselves safe, but definitely making sure they know about resources is helpful. So for the healthcare providers, are, are there uh, regional conferences, national conferences where different organizations can can convene to share ideas on how to approach some of these topics and what to look out for? That's such a great question. If folks are really interested in partner violence prevention, um, the national, um, so Futures Without Violence has the National Health and Domestic Violence Conference, which is bi biannual. So every other year, that's a great conference if, if people want that focus. And it's nice because it's multidisciplinary. Um, there are, there is going to be a workshop at the AAP conference that my colleague and I are running on partner violence if people are going to be there and are interested. And there is, there are always, you know, there's an upcoming, actually tomorrow there's, um, a conference on social media and partner violence. So there's always like a, a you know, a lot of great conferences that happen on, on both topics, on language equity and on partner violence. Um, but definitely if, if you want, if anyone's interested in they're going to the AAP conference in no, in October, excuse me, in San Diego, there will definitely be workshops there as well. Do you have any other resources that healthcare providers can use to become more comfortable with these topics? As um, many of us don't have uh, nearly as much training or any training at all in these topics. Um, are there any like CME courses that you've done before? Any um, websites that other providers could use to become more familiar with these topics? Yeah. So yeah, great question. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics has a new IPV website. It's got a lot of information on it. And I think that they're working on, um, on adding in we, as part of the research that I was talking about, the COVID research. Um, we've also created some videos for pediatricians. So that's going to be up on that website soon. So that's a great place to start. The AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, also has an IPV policy statement, which is excellent. It's just about to get redone a little bit, but but even the one that isn't from 2010 that's going to be updated is, is, is great to look at. HealthyChildren.org, which I know we all use, has a uh, something for parents on stress and domestic violence and COVID um, that, that is helpful. Um, let's see what other resources are helpful. The National Domestic Violence Hotline has a lot of great resources as well. Um, and then the Women's Center and Shelter, um, their, their medical advocate is so generous with her time and, um, will often come and give talks to different divisions. So she's like spoken at our division before. Excellent, very practical presentation on how to support survivors. And so, you know, if, if folks want to make that connection, they could always reach out to me um, if they want to talk on domestic violence or I use domestic violence and intimate partner violence inter interchangeably here. Yeah, I think that those those are some good resources to start. That's awesome. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of that information with us because I know that I it is fascinating for me to hear all of your work. It is also overwhelming for me to hear all of this because this is a topic um, that I think a lot of us are uncomfortable with because they're difficult conversations and difficult um, different difficult experiences to even think about. It's very important. So, yeah. 
Oh, it's absolutely important. Do you have any other like social media or websites that folks should know about for you personally or your division for more information about um, your research in particular? Yeah, absolutely. And just to like comment on what you just said, the, the, usually when I start talks about partner violence, the first thing I say is like, take a deep breath and take care of yourself. This is very, very difficult to hear. Right. Mm -hmm. And partner, I mean, I didn't, I didn't say this earlier. Partner violence is incredibly pervasive. Like, you know, a lot of statistics are one in three, which means many of the folks listening may have experienced it themselves, may have friends, loved ones, family who've experienced partner violence. So absolutely, like as you're, if you're interested in diving more into this, into this space, excuse me, please, um, just know that it can be really hard. Um, this is a hard thing to talk about and um, it's okay to like take the time you need to process all of this. And in terms of websites, my website through uh, Pitt Pediatrics has some information about my work. Um, I do have a, a Twitter a Twitter handle that I'm trying to use more frequently now, which is M.I. Rakavan. And um, I'm working on building up some more stuff as well. Um, and then some of the work that I've done, you will be able to see on the IPV um, website through the AAP. I think that those are a good place to start or or just email me. I'd love to talk with you. We are so thankful that you were Thank able to come so and talk with us about this. Uh, and we're also really thankful that you you took the dive into the to come to the Pittsburgh community right. even during the midst of the pandemic. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and your research. And thanks for listening to That's Pediatrics. Great. Thank you so much. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. For more information about this podcast or our guests, please visit chp.edu slash that's pediatrics. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to keep up with our new content. You can also email us at podcast.upmc at gmail.com with any feedback or ideas for topics you'd like our experts to cover on future episodes. Thank you again for listening to That's Pediatrics. Tune in next time.